Please join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Our congregation's history begins in hearts and minds of faithful dissent. By the late 1840s, a growing movement of Christian abolitionists was gaining strength in the struggle against slavery. Abolitionist Christians could no longer abide in the union of Christian faith and a nation which embraced in any way the existence of slaves and slave owners. They believed human beings are not property. They are human beings. In Columbus in 1852, a cluster of such believers from Second Presbyterian Church decided that they were Congregationalists at heart, and they parted amicably with Second Presbyterian to form, first of all, Third Presbyterian Church. And I might note here, they called themselves that, but they never actually joined the Presbytery. With 42 people transferring membership on Friday, September 24th, 1852, the members of Second Presbyterian sent them off with this benediction. And listen carefully to these words. In view of the importance of this occasion, we add our expression of sympathy with those who leave us and an earnest desire that the great head of the church may be with you, may be with them, and help them. May he make them a church of his own to glorify him and promote his kingdom in the world. And may those who remain and those who go, when toil is here finished, meet in heaven and together form a part of the church triumphant there. Wow. What a blessing. They also sent them with a $1,000 loan, which is the equivalent in our time of about $33,000, and provided them this money so that their sisters and brothers could build a church of their own on the corner of the northeast corner of 3rd Street and Lynn Alley, which in today's terms you would know as the entrance to the parking garage at the Renaissance Hotel downtown. There's a framed chapel that was erected there as the first of our churches. A formal call was extended to the Reverend William Marble, and under Reverend Marble's earnest and integral leadership, the chapel was dedicated on July 11th, and the congregation first worshiped in their new chapel on Sunday, September 26th, 1852, as 27 women and 15 men gathered to praise God and turn their resistance to slavery into faithful action. They officially signed the charter later that week, and so it began. In 1856, the church was fittingly renamed the first congregational church, Columbus. With church membership steadily increasing, First Church entertained plans for a more spacious building, and they followed the admonition of Henry Bowen, a leading abolitionist and congregationalist who said, buy a lot facing the State House and build a good building, so they will have to see you every day. The bravest policy is the best. They did just that. They purchased land directly across from the State House, there's a footprint of the old building that's a parking lot behind what is Key Bank today, next to the Columbus Dispatch on the north side of Broad Street. And there they began under the leadership of their new pastor, Reverend J.M. Steele. Only five months into his pastorate, the young and energetic Reverend Steele set out for New York City to make good on the abolitionists of New York's backing of this church to raise $7,000 for the Norman-style building. Tragically, he contracted smallpox during the pursuit and died there shortly thereafter. Grieving their loss, the brave little congregation pressed on, and on December 23, 1857, they dedicated their new building 
there at 74 East Broad Street. That became the location of First Church for the next 74 years until we opened this building at 444 East Broad 89 years ago this December. First Congregational Church was the first white abolitionist church in Columbus, Ohio. As early Christian abolitionists, we joined with several other black congregations, including Second Baptist Church under the leadership of the famed, renowned, and great leader, the Reverend James Preston Poindexter, who was their pastor for 50 years. We joined with them to free slaves and to support the work of the Underground Railroad. Second Baptist was right behind First Church on Gay Street, so our back doors met in Lynn Alley. Our fellowship in those years was tied closely to our black abolitionist sisters and brothers. Together, we formed what I would call the first interracial work for justice in Columbus's history. Our origin story is a remarkable story of determination and commitment to racial justice. I have often wondered what happened on the first day of First Church, then Third Presbyterian. We know there were 42 charter members with the women leading the way, 27 strong and 15 men. And I've never said their names out loud in one place until today, but I think it's very important for us to hear their names as they sign the book alphabetically to begin this journey. Hear their names. This is based on my best interpretation of their handwriting. Mrs. Amelia Adams, Mr. Thomas S. Baldwin, Mrs. Matilda A. Baldwin, Mr. Michael B. Batham, Mrs. Josephine C. Batham, Mrs. Eliza Burgaff, Mrs. Eliana Edgar, Mrs. Sarah Ann Edwards, Mr. Charles H. Goss, Mrs. Sarah Goss, Mr. Andrew Gunning, Mrs. Mary M. Gunning, Dr. J.C. Hamilton, Mrs. Rachel H. Hamilton, Reverend Warren Jenkins, Mrs. Mary M. Jenkins, Mr. Matthew Long, Mrs. Mary Long, Mrs. A. E. B. McGrary, Mrs. Mary E. Hosgood, Mr. George Otscott, Mrs. Elizabeth Otscott, Miss Dana C. Pearson, Mrs. Phoebe D. Rankin, Mrs. Mary Jane Reed, Mr. L. L. Rice, Mrs. Sarah Rice, Miss Elizabeth Ridgway, Mrs. Mary Searles, Mr. Francis C. Sessions, Mrs. Mary J. Sessions, Mrs. Lydia C. Stanton, Mr. Samuel B. Stanton, Mrs. A. E. Strickland, Mrs. Elizabeth Tuttle, Mr. James R. Tuttle, Mr. C. Wall, Mrs. Elizabeth Wall, Miss Mary White, Mrs. Jane Wilkins, Mr. Abraham Alvin Wright, and Mrs. Mary A. Wright. It's the first time I've said all their names together. It is a true honor and joy to hear their names and to speak them aloud, because without them, we're not here. Who were these people? What were their life stories? How did they get to America? How did they get to Ohio? How did they get to Columbus? What work did they do? How many children did they have? What became of them in the years that followed? Our records show that 20 of the 42 were dismissed, which is a bit of a severe word, but that's the word they used for a transfer of membership. Of those 20, 10 went on to start other churches. Some were dismissed with just a date. Did they leave the Christian faith? We don't know the backstory, so let's not make one up. What drove them to do the right thing for racial justice and for social justice? I wonder so many things about day one at First Church. Who was in worship that day? Were there guests? How many children were there? What were their names? What did the children think about leaving their old church and their friends just four blocks to the south down the street on Third Street? Were some of the married women widows 
Were their husbands opposed to this move or they joined on their own? Were their husbands not churchgoers? What did Reverend Marvel preach about that day? What were his texts? What were the hymns that they sang? Did they have ushers? Did they have deacons? What was the choir doing? Was there a choir? Who was the director? Did they have communion at this table right here on the first day? Were there any baptisms that day? What happened after church? Who did they invite to their church cookout? How did they translate their strong abolitionist beliefs blended with this powerful faith in Jesus Christ and turn it into action on behalf of men and women and children who were treated as three-quarter human and enslaved just 110 miles to the south across the Ohio River in Kentucky and beyond. Here we are, 168 years and one day later. We have been blessed by their brave vision of a better world, a nation where slavery ended, in part due to their work and battling to bring it to an end. Although we continue to battle the vestige of slavery's racially dividing effects up to this current day, 61,362 days have passed since the first day of First Church. So much has changed, but four things remain the same. First, we are blessed to have the communion table which survived all the way to this present moment. My guess is in that little building they built to begin with, it looked huge. Today, the building surrounds it, it still is huge. It connects us sacramentally and spiritually with our 42 forebearers. Second, we have God's word as our constant companion that has been with us for 2,000 years and more. We are inspired, like they were, to follow God's word still today. Third, we share their deep call to racial justice and being anti-racists, whose expression was so powerfully demonstrated by starting our congregation. And fourth, we share the covenant that they gave us. Our church's covenant for 168 years has been the same. Perhaps they read it first on Sunday, September 26, 1852. I invite you to read it now. You will find it on page two of the worship program, the bulletin today. It reads like this. We covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ and one another and bind ourselves in the presence of God to live together in all God's ways as revealed to us by the Holy Spirit and Holy Scripture. The church acknowledges that all members have the right of individual interpretation of the principles of the Christian faith and respects them in their honest convictions. In accordance with the teaching of our Lord, the church recognizes two sacraments, baptism and Holy Communion. And there it ends. Very simple, just a few sentences. 61,362 days have passed since these words were first penned and written and shared. These are powerful words that claim our Trinitarian faith, ground us in God's word, and connect us by the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion. And they connect us forever with what I consider to be a radical statement of faith. The church acknowledges that all members have the right of individual interpretation of the principles of the Christian faith and respects them in their honest convictions. In other words, each one of us lives in this belief that I honor and respect your interpretation of the principles of the Christian faith and that I honor and respect you in your honest convictions. And the same comes back to me. This is an open and affirming statement long before we crafted ours 18 years ago. I happen to know that within this congregation, we have a wonderfully wide range of beliefs, interpretations of our faith, and tons of honest convictions. I know that there have been probably tens of thousands of people who have journeyed with us at Faith at First Church. Many of them are dearly beloved to us. Each one has believed differently things that they hold true and dear about God, 
about Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the church, the universe, and about who we are and how we express ourselves as children of God. Some have interpreted our faith in such a way that they have been ordained to preach the gospel like Joyce Whelan was last weekend. Others have been called to mission work and other forms of service in the church. They've been called out in every vocation beyond the walls of the church. And they interpret this in their daily lives, in their daily walk, and they have, some of them have been led through their interpretation to seek other faith expressions. And for some, this interpretation has led them to walk away from faith altogether. This covenant calls us to individual interpretation and honest convictions. Following this covenant leads us to trust in God and trust that God is still speaking. It means that we have to trust ourselves enough to challenge what we believe is wrong and to embrace and act upon what we know is right. In his memoir entitled Black Boy, published in 1945, Richard Wright puts it this way, ought one to surrender to authority even if one believed that that authority was wrong? If the answer was yes, then I knew that I would always be wrong because I could never do it. Then how could one live in a world in which one's mind and perceptions meant nothing and authority and tradition meant everything? There were no answers. To my brother Richard Wright, I only wish that you had been here and could have journeyed with us because here you would have been accepted in your challenge to authority and your honest convictions. Today, we pause to give thanks to God for the legacy of First Church and for the founders in faith who had the courage and vision to create our congregation and then trusted God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit to guide them forward. Like the Exodus story, we can only imagine the hardships and the joys they encountered. Like the letter of Paul to the church at Philippi, we pray that we can continue to carry forth their encouragement, their love, their compassion and sympathy, their humility in looking out for the interests of others, and they're counting on Jesus to lead them to be anti-racist and stop the hemorrhaging hate and abuse of Native people and African Americans. And like Jesus, in his parable of the two sons, we can only pray that our actions speak louder than our words and our actions are honest and true and speak for themselves. I pray today that we remember and celebrate with gratitude and joy the 42 who had the vision and courage to follow their convictions and create a church home for us here in the heart of Ohio, in the heart of Columbus, and in the heart of the love of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God for each one of them. And thanks be to God for each one of you. Amen.